Malls are being abandoned all over the United States and their dusty, looming structures remind us of a different time when people couldn't just buy anything they wanted from the comfort of their couch. The fall of these shopping destinations has big implications for the future, but not necessarily in the ways that you might think. A huge thank you to Ground News for sponsoring today's video. In the last couple of years, there's emerged a trend on YouTube where people go and explore abandoned stuff. These are basically the brave spelunkers of late stage capitalism having a go with their flashlights and camera phones, exploring the aftermath of once thriving locales. And one of the most popular destinations for these voyeurs of failed dreams is the American Mall. There is something just inherently fascinating about these places that are designed for lots of people to enjoy being completely empty. Like an episode of The Walking Dead in real life or something. There's also a sort of sick fascination that we have with watching something so institutional and so emblematic of the American dream just rotting away. Now right off the bat, we have to elaborate that no, not all malls are struggling and closing down. Some of them are still selling lots of stuff and making money and whatnot, but there has been a decline in the number of malls over the last decade. Mostly because there was just too many of these things in the first place, but also because of the internet and the way that it changed the way that we shop forever. But we're gonna be talking about that later. However, through our research for this script, we found an article stating record online shopping this last holiday season. And we wouldn't have known this if it weren't for ground news. We can see this story has over eight sources from all across the political spectrum with degrees of factuality. We've actually been using ground news's app and website for a while now. We appreciate the value of having access to richer context than mainstream media typically provides. And honestly, we can't imagine consuming or curating our information for these videos in any other way. If we look into this story a little bit deeper, we can see that The Hill, tagged as high factuality and center leaning, is pretty straight to the point with their article title. However, Bloomberg and Fox Business, both mixed factuality from either end of the political spectrum, focus more on the cause of this, buy now, pay later plans. Knowing who's funding these articles and what their motivations are can help us make informed conclusions on any kind of subject. And that's not the only reason that we come back to ground news time and time again. It's also because we just genuinely believe in what they're doing with their mission. It's pretty well exactly aligned with what ours is here at Future Proof. We wanna help people make informed decisions and practice critical thinking every step of the way. Plus, they're based in Canada, just like us. So check them out at ground.news futureproof. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar a month or get 30% off unlimited access through our link in the description. First, I think I need to get some of my bias out of the way here. I am not a guy who likes malls, particularly. I'd rather tour an abandoned mall with a bunch of random dudes I met on the internet than go to a regular mall amongst the mall walkers. However, I think that it's important that we appreciate and recognize the cachet that the local mall has held in North American culture for decades. See, online shopping Gen Zers today don't understand that before the internet, the mall was quite literally the place to be. The place to be seen and see other people being seen by other people. Especially as a teenager, this was one of the only places where there was no adult supervision for the most part. Now, if you want to get an idea of what the vibe was like back then, movies and shows from various decades form a pretty good reference point. Like True Stories, Chopping Mall, Can't Buy Me Love, Dawn of the Dead, Fast Times at Ridge Mont High, Inner Space, I never watched that one, The Blues Brothers, Wonder Woman, Mall Rats, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Mean Girls. There is literally tons of shows that have malls at the center of them. This was basically the cultural melting pot for youths over the last 60 years. There was cheap food, security to keep things from getting out of control, bathrooms, running water, and endless entertainment of looking through racks and racks of posters at HMV. You can get just a taste of this experience through this very pixelated video from 14 years ago. 
It was like free babysitting for teenagers. If your parents were okay with entrusting their beloved child to a bored Gap employee, luckily for the entire economy, most parents actually were. And thus, the mall indirectly kept a large sector of the economy going for decades. Now, stores would change over time as fads came in and out of style. Stores entirely devoted to calendars or t-shirts with dirty slogans on them, onesie pajamas, and even stuff that you'd seen on TV could be found at your local mall. Now at this point, it seems kind of fun, you know, harmless, even kind of a genius business model. But believe me when I say that the business model was designed not to benefit the citizens who frequented there, but the corporations who were selling the stuff. Corporations loved malls because this was the place where they could groom youth as a captive audience into being good consumers as adults. Going from buying dong-shaped novelty items at Spencer's Gifts to buying really expensive vacuums from Best Buy. But unlike most inventions under capitalism, the mall was not actually invented purely to manipulate us into buying more stuff. It was originally supposed to help us live better lives. See, the man who invented malls was an idealistic Austrian Jewish inventor named Victor Gruen. He came to America after a little thing called the Second World War, and when he got here, he missed the beautiful and picturesque storefronts of his homeland. The walkable streets, the little boutiques and coffee shops and bistros where folks could just stroll around at their leisure and interact with their other members of their community. Gruen was upset by American retail areas, which in contrast were strip malls, and those suck. Even worse than the strip malls themselves are the parking lots in front of them that are slowly killing all of us. If you wanna hear my rant about parking lots, you can look forward to another video, which is gonna be kind of a follow-up to this one coming very soon to this channel, so maybe subscribe. Gruen's idea was to make the shopping mall not just more navigable, but better for communities. He wanted to have malls function as what sociologists call third spaces. Safe and neutral spaces that aren't home or work where people can meet and, in Gruen's words, provide the needed place and opportunity for participation in modern community life. Basically, he wanted the mall to be kind of like the town squares of the past. The first mall Gruen designed was actually pretty awesome. The Southdale Center in Adena, Missitona, Pisonadona. The Southdale Center in Edina, Minnesota has fountains, an aviary, and even has a large art installation. Now, this was a little watered down from his original vision, which included a medical center, schools, residences. But even still, when Southdale premiered in 1956, Groom was basically seen as a genius of urban development. But sadly, malls turned into what we know them to be today, and Gruen had this to say about his most famous invention, reflecting on his career two years before his death. I would like to take this opportunity to disclaim paternity once and for all. I refuse to pay alimony to those bastard developments. They destroyed our city. The man knew he was gonna die. Like, like he knew that this was like his final moment to say something to the world before he like checked out and he was like, I fucking hate you guys. Don't put my name on there. <laughs> Which is kind of badass, honestly. But okay, so we're gonna catch up to why malls are failing today. And to understand why, you have to understand how malls work. Malls need three to four anchor stores to function properly. Anchor stores are big stores, basically traditional one-stop shop department stores like Macy's or, you know, The Bay or something if you're in Canada. The idea is that these big stores lure people in and then when they're done at that store, they might wander down one of the arms of the mall to check out what's nearby. Due to the economics of scale, the prices at the anchor stores are usually pretty cheap and their large name gives credibility and loyal customer bases something to show up for. These anchor stores are crucial and you can tell about how well a mall is doing based on their performance. The other smaller feeder stores will cycle through, but their performance is basically entirely dependent on whether or not Macy's is selling whatever Macy's sells. I've never been in a Macy's, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I, I've, I've really just never, I don't understand 
understand that reference completely. Recently though, in Canada, malls were left scrambling when Nordstrom pulled out of the frozen north as they had been a reliable high-end retail anchor for decades. And when one anchor leaves, the stores in the mall inevitably start to close their doors too. But now listen, I'm sure you're, you're at your keyboard ready with your um actuallys, and you wanna explain that in fact, Levi, the death of the mall is easily explained. It's online shopping. <laughs> Duh. Levi, we're too easily tempted by free shipping and too vexed by the very thought of human to human social interactions in the real world. Now listen, it is an easy assumption to make that online shopping has killed malls, but a red herring, any tall tale it is, and one that we here at Future Proof are going to hold ourselves to a higher standard on. In fact, according to Meet Me by the Fountain author Alexandra Large, online shopping actually only occupies about 20% of clothes, home goods, and other retail sales, and has stayed at 20% pretty consistently since the pandemic. The hair in the pudding of online shopping killed mall story is that odd little fact that malls in Europe are actually doing totally fine, and online shopping exists there too. In fact, they're not just doing fine. Post-pandemic, they're rebounding into doing great. Partially what has happened is that mall anchors, AKA the department stores, are no longer the determinants of taste that they used to be. For a long time, things were very top down. Designers would come up with new clothes and other changes to housewares and furniture or whatever. Then the local housewives would take a break from their chain smoking in their suburban houses to go and look what rich people had decided would make them the most stylish Jones on their block. But today, trends come from everywhere, right? We got blogs, we've got TikTok style roundups, and you can buy anything you want from Shein and get it within like five business days of the trend even being conceptualized. And yes, I know that in a roundabout sort of way, I am saying that the internet is kind of to blame for the fall of malls, but it is not just online shopping. Probably one of the most under-discussed reasons why the American mall is dying today is poor municipal planning. Now look, we talk about this a lot more in the parking lots video, which is coming out soon, but basically driving to get to a mall is kind of a giant pain in the ass. People don't want to have to stuff their kids into a car, get them to the mall, pull them out of the car, go into the store, walk around with them for hours when they could just hand them an iPad at home and keep them entertained, right? Don't believe me? Well, in the States, the public transit system is actually so bad that you basically have to drive everywhere and malls are failing. Whereas in Europe, public transit is very comprehensive and well-developed and you can go places quite easily by train or bus and their malls are thriving. Sadly, this geography major can't just blame all of the world's problems on the vehicle. Also at play here in the decline of North American malls is the increasing divide between upper, middle, and lower and working classes. See, folks with less cash are more likely to go to outlet stores like Walmart or, or dollar stores or buy things secondhand on online marketplaces or at thrift stores. This is evidenced by the fact that what are known as class A malls are doing totally fine. These are luxury malls for people who have way too much money, just so we're clear on that. Because here's the thing, when corporations back in the day were like, hey, why don't we move our factories to China and make our products cheaper there? They kind of forgot that this meant that they would be taking away high paying jobs from the public, which meant that there would be less money in the economy for folks to go to the mall with. In Europe, there are typically more regulations around this kind of thing, so people generally have a little bit more money to go around and they spend it at, you guessed it, the mall. Now, of course, this is just what we've found in our research and, and saying Europe is pretty broad. Of course, there's a lot of different people and cultures and countries within the spectrum of Europe. So if you have a different perspective or you've seen something different in Europe versus the US, please let us know down in the comments. We are always happy to be corrected if some of our research doesn't line up with reality. The decline in the United States is so steep that nearly half of the malls that were around during the 60s and the 80s will be closed in the next five five years. Add this to the fact that upper middle classes are increasingly preferring boutique experiences for their retail excursions, Gen Z kids being able to hang out in digital third places like Minecraft servers and whatnot, and the fact that America has more than five times the retail space the UK does, and you've got a recipe for an oversaturation of a product that nobody really wants anymore. 
Malls are on the chopping block. How do they rebrand to slow the bleeding? Some malls have added just a bit of Disney to the experience. Ski slopes, amusement parks, bungee jumping, petting zoos, concerts, whatever that they can do to make the mall more of a destination, which is probably smart, but it's not really working because of the same public planning and economic issues that we talked about before. The malls who are actually seeing a lasting revitalization are actually the ones a little closer to Victor Gruen's original vision, hosting community colleges, office spaces, ice rinks, churches, and other community spaces where people can gather meaningfully. So yeah, the mall as we know it today is probably dead, and maybe that's a good thing. We just gotta hope that the thing that replaces it doesn't suck so bad. If you have any examples of malls that you think are doing the right thing, we'd love to see that down in the comments below. And of course, if you enjoyed today's video, remember to like it and subscribe to see new content every single week.